Hi, my name is Exley and I'm from Christ Heritage Church. And while we uh, recognize the providence of God in spreading His gospel message through online videos, uh, this video may be used by God to edify you and to encourage you. But we believe that it is important for a Christian to attend a, to a local church. We believe that it is important for a Christian to be a member of a local church where he can exercise the ministerial gifts given by God. We believe that it is important for a Christian to sit under the preaching of a local pastor. And so the preacher in this video cannot and should not replace the office of the pastor in your, in your local church. Uh, it is our prayer that this video may help you, but again, we strongly insist that you don't miss out in the ordinary means of grace being done in your local church. Thank you. So this same month, January, is the month when Adoniram Judson first translated the Bible to Burmese in 1834. Burmese is the Myanmar language. Now, Judson was a missionary to India and then to Burma. And many years prior, his translation to the Bible, uh, of the Bible, he pleaded the emperor of Burma, the king there, in the hope to grant the missionaries freedom to preach the gospel in Burma. Well, at that time, the emperor disregarded his appeal and the emperor threw one of his gospel tracts to the ground after reading a few lines. Well, it was a big discouragement uh, for that time uh, for Judson, but it led him to ultimately become one of the great missionaries used by God. Well, as Christians, we also plea to God. And unlike the emperor of Burma, our king, Jesus Christ, grants freedom not just to preach the gospel, but freedom from darkness into light. And prior to this, Christ died and he was raised from the dead. And at the resurrection, he was installed as a king. If Judson was known for his accomplishments in Burma, Jesus Christ was known for his accomplishment in his life, death, resurrection, enthronement, supremacy, and headship. Our passage this morning is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith to the, in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of, our, of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So in the past weeks, we have been talking about this section of, uh, in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church where he prayed uh, for them to be given enlightenment. For them to understand the hope that they are called for. For them to understand the glorious inheritance that they have. For them to understand the, the immeasurable greatness of the power of God. And then he gives us a historical evidence of the power, of this power, as seen in what happened to Christ after death. And that he was raised from the dead, he, ex he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, and that resurrection, that enthronement, uh, gave him that supremacy and headship. 
And he was, as we know, installed as king and he was given ruling powers. And when we talk about rule, we're talking about a kingship. We're talking about a kingdom. And the kingdom of God is the rule and the dominion of Christ. For he was made king at his resurrection. But since this is still part of the prayer of Paul for the church, the question now is, what specifically then is expected of the church when it comes to the topic of the kingdom? What is the role of the church in the rule of Christ? So this morning, my message is that the church is set apart for the manifestation of the rule of our exalted King, Jesus Christ. Ang iglesia ay hiniwalay para sa pagpapahayag ng paghahari ng ating itinaas na hari na si Heso Kristo. And take note, take note that Paul here talks about the church as in all the Christians who lived at any point of time or place. That is what we call the universal church. And that the universal church, these all Christians in the world, are set apart to be the manifestation of the kingdom of Christ. That when the world sees the Christians, they should know that the Christians are, are living in a different kingdom, living in a different world. That when they are seen by the world, the Christians, uh, they should know that Christians are representing a certain king who rules. So there is the universal church. But every local church is a manifestation of the universal church. So that means as one local church, we too should be a manifestation of the kingdom of God. That whatever is expected from all the Christians should of course be evident in every local church. And today I have two specific things that are expected of us. First is the realization of the rule maunawaan natin ang pamamahala ng Panginoong Heso Kristo. And secondly, the responsibility under the rule. Yung responsibilidad sa ilalim ng pamamahala ng Haring Heso Kristo. And so first, realization of the rule. It is just right for the church, God's people, to have this kind of realization of their inclusion to the, in the kingdom of God. Now we may ask, what kind of kingship is this? What kind of rule is this? First, we see him being installed as king in verse 20. It says, When he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We see here Christ's enthronement as a king. From being dead, he was raised and exalted. And this verse tells us that this kingship this rule is in the heavenly places. So we see the nature of this kingdom. This is not just talking about the place itself. That's why when Pontius Pilate asked Jesus Christ, he questioned Jesus Christ, Christ answered in John chapter 18, verse 36, ang sabi niya, my kingdom is not of this world. So he's talking about the kingdom being immaterial. He's not talking about a specific place. He's saying that his kingdom is opposite to that of this world. It is otherworldly. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Just as how Paul says in what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, that every Christian receive every uh, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. The same thing. The kingdom of God, the rule of Christ is also spiritual. And it is spiritual because it is the Holy Spirit who applies the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, bringing sinners unto His Lordship under His rule. It is the Holy Spirit who applies the salvation that Christ did on the cross. Remember, we have been studying soteriology in Sunday school. The Spirit applies the salvation through regeneration through sanctification, changing the heart of the person. 
changing his will for that person to be to respond in faith in Christ. And so one's entry to this immaterial kingdom of Christ is through the Spirit's work. That's why Christ said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He was referring to that regenerating, cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. But Paul wasn't just saying that Christ was exalted as king in the heavenly places. He further describes the kingdom in verse 21. As far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Paul was just reminding us that Christ was made king. Was, that Christ became king. He's also reminding us of Christ's supremacy. He is supreme over all rule, over all authority, over anyone powerful, over any dominion. Christ's rule is above any governments, any earthly authority there is. Now just think about the time when Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesian church. There were various leaders, authorities who were ruling at that time. And no doubt the highest among them all, Roman Empire. And the emperor that time was Emperor Nero. So, and that, that Roman Empire is a really, really big empire. It covers the whole of Europe and Africa. And again, the one with the highest authority was Nero, was Emperor Nero. And so Paul was aware of Nero when he wrote that letter. He's aware of what kind of government Nero had. But Paul was saying in this passage that when he's reminded of how, of how Christ being raised by the power of God, how Christ was enthroned to the right hand of the Father, that makes Christ above. That makes Christ above everyone else above every other rules or any other earthly governments. For Paul, that is incomparable to anyone ruling on earth. And earthly authorities, of course, are not perfect. We know that because, because of sin. And these earthly ruling authorities are still sinners. In fact, in Romans chapter 13, Paul tells us that any governing authority is instituted by God. Regardless if the ruler is a man of God or not, Paul calls the ruler a servant of God, not a servant in a sense that he saved him as ser saved servant, not that kind of servant, but servant as in an agent of God to deliver either a blessing to the place or wrath. So we see here the supremacy of Christ. His supreme rule over all things. Not only that, His kingdom, verse 21 says, is not only in this age, but also in the one to come. His kingdom is not of this world. It is above all rule. It transcends time. He is not just ruling now. He will also be ruling in the coming age. Jesus told the Pharisees in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. In other words, Christ was saying, was making a proclamation of the arrival of the kingdom. That the kingdom has already arrived in His arrival. So there is a sense that the kingdom of Christ has already come but has not fully concluded. It has not fully completed. It has already come because people are getting saved now. People are being justified now from their sins. People are being redeemed. People are being ushered into the rule of Christ now. But there is a sense that it has not been completed yet because people are still sinners. People are not glorified with Christ yet. 
So there is an already, but not yet, sense when we talk about the kingdom of God. And Christ brought the kingdom of God in His first coming. He, he brought His rule when He first came, and He will complete it when He returns. His kingdom will fully be realized when He returns. Now, what does this tell us? That, this king, that His kingdom is above all rule, His kingdom is above all power, but also His kingdom is everlasting. It has already started, and it will slowly, fully spread to the entire world world this kingdom will last forever i like how my teacher in school whenever he compares the the kingdom of god over other kingdoms <coughs> earthly kingdoms he makes these illustrations so i'm gonna use them you know in at the time of paul like i said a while ago it is the roman empire who has the highest authority over many nations uh, the emperor at that time was the ruler and that Roman Empire was called the Eternal Empire. And Rome was the eternal city. But we know in 5th century, the Roman Empire fell. And Saddam Hussein, he bragged about Iraq being called the Eternal Province. But after a few years, his rule ended and he died. And Adolf Hitler who became a chancellor of Germany, formed the Third Reich. And he, he said that the Third Reich will last for a thousand years. It took him only 12 years. Now, no government, no kingdom other than Christ's is eternal. And so Christ rules in the heavenly places. Christ rules above all. And Christ rules forever in his kingdom and this rule is manifested in the church the church who are the christians are the subjects or the servants of the kingdom as the church grows the kingdom spreads as the church realizes her kingdom benefits her inclusion of it and also the spiritual blessings if they realize this the church is Filled, is being filled by Christ. Paul calls the church as Christ's fullness, meaning Christ himself fills the church. Now this is parallel to Paul's prayer in chapter 3, verse 17. And he, he said, when he was praying, that Christ, his, his prayer is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so Christ fills for himself the church with all these spiritual blessings. And when the church realizes this, the fullness of Christ is manifested in the church. Imagine a church where the Spirit of God dwell in each, in each member's hearts. Imagine a church that is rooted and grounded in love. This is how Christ fills the church. And this is how the church becomes the fullness of Christ. So this is what it looks like being in the kingdom of God. They received and are receiving the kingdom benefits, or as Paul calls them in verses 3 to 14, the spiritual blessings. And if these kingdom blessings are evident in the life of the church, then the rule of Christ manifests in the life of the church. And if Christ says that his kingdom is everlasting, then as Christians, we are to have that realization that our inclusion to the kingdom will never be revoked. And if Christ says that His kingdom rules above all, then as Christians, we are set apart to manifest and to display that our king is above all rulers. 
And so if Christ says that his kingdom is opposite to this world, then as Christians are set apart to manifest that we live in an opposite world, you're not really going to be surprised anymore when you feel like the world is against you. You're not, you're not going to be surprised anymore if you are persecuted because of your faith. Because you are a part of an everlasting kingdom that is opposite to the temporary earthly kingdom, kingdoms whose rulers are way lower than your king who is above all the rulers of this age. Let's say you went to a country, a country with a, say, different language, and you live in a house with a family there for a day. They speak a different language, they have a different culture, so of course, there may be a lot of miscommunication, uh, cultural barriers and all, um, given the differences, and you may feel that you're not part of that family, of course. But what more? If we're talking about spiritual concerns, spiritual matters, we are living in this earth, and the def differences are not physical, nor material, but spiritual. Different inclinations, different purposes, different thinking, differences in whom we are worshiping. So here's the challenge for all of us. As members of the kingdom of God, let us faithfully represent our king. Let us pray to God for the church, all the saints in the world, that the church would give importance to her representation of the king. Bilang mga miyembro ng iglesia, ng church, kasama tayo sa kaharian ng Diyos. Nararapat lamang nakatawanin natin ang hari natin na si Jesus Cristo. Let us realize and embrace the nature of the kingdom of God and how in this kingdom, a part of the rule of Christ is that He fills the church. That the church's life is dependent upon the active work of our King, Jesus Christ. But then as human beings with God-given wills, we should do our part. How are we representing Christ in this church? How can His rule manifest in the church, in the local church? We should be faithful in everything that we do in the church. Faithful in our worship to God. This is what we're doing whenever we meet every Lord's Day. We recognize the King. Kinikilala natin ang hari tuwing nagkikita tayo, nagkakasama tayo tuwing linggo. And as, as we have been learning from the Word in the past weeks, of course, worship. And part of that worship is prayer. And Paul is praying in this passage. It's something that we, has, we have been learning in the past weeks. Corporate prayer. Yes, we meet and we learn about our King every Sunday. And we hear from our King Jesus from His Word every Sunday. But do we talk corporately as one church, bringing our concerns as one body to our King? You want... We want, as one church, to manifest the rule of Christ. Before we go out and, 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 and do evangelism, primarily our focus should be corporate worship. That we do not neglect meeting together, that we should be faithful in our listening, in proclaiming the word, in the observance of the sacraments, faithful in discipline, and most importantly, as Paul shows us in this passage, we are to be faithful as one church in prayer. Now, do we have that as a church? Do we have a time to just sit down and hear the concerns of our members and pray for one another, and pray for other churches. So realizing this rule demands, of course, submission to Christ's rule as a king. My last point is the responsibility under his rule. We mentioned a while ago that Christ rules in the heavenly places. He rules above all rulers. He rules, uh, his rule is everlasting. And in verse 23, it tells us that even though not everyone knows him, even though not everyone has faith in him, 
all things were put under His feet. He rules over all creation. And specifically, for the church, Paul says that Christ is not just the ruler of the church, but He is the head. He is the head and the church is the body. Yes, Jesus Christ is king. Yes, Jesus Christ transcends all things. He stands over all things. He has supremacy in everything over the dead and the living, even the earthly and the heavenly, even the physical and the spiritual, because Jesus is fully God and He is first above all. But there is this closeness. There is this intimacy. He is head to a body. He is head to His body, the church. The exalted, transcendent Christ is inseparably connected to His people whom He redeemed. While Jesus is head over every power and authority and king of every man in the sense that He is Lord over all creation, He is uniquely head to the church in His affection to her. In other words, the sovereign ruler of the universe loves the church intimately. So as he is ruler over all, that does not mean that everyone, everyone else are in his kingdom. Only those who have faith in Christ are in his kingdom. The church is the only ones who are under the intimate rule of Christ. And so this morning, you may have, you, you probably have not put your faith in the king, the one who was exalted after his death. He resurrected. He was made king by God because of obtaining righteousness, because of his complete obedience and fulfillment of the law while he was alive. And of course, his death satisfied the wrath of God. His death on the cross his death become he he became the substitute to those people whom supposed to die and receive the wrath of god and so this morning that is a call for you to come to christ now turn away from your sins and come to christ as the lord and savior of your life come now to the throne of grace. Come now to the foot of the cross and receive the grace of Christ that is available for you. But if you neglect, if you reject this good news, then you are not part of the kingdom of Christ. And you will not get the kingdom benefits. And you will get the curse and that is separation from God eternally. And so this morning, I want to ask you, if you have not yet put your faith, please do so. Please. And since, and for us, for us Christians, let this be a reminder that we are under the rule of the King. And that we receive these benefits that are freely given to us by Christ, by virtue of what He has done on the cross. But as receivers, as recipients of these blessings, we also have kingdom responsibilities. That's what Paul is saying in verse 23. God gave Christ as head over all things to the church. Meaning it is us who are expected to manifest this rule of Christ. It is the church who, are, who is entrusted the fullness of the kingdom of Christ. Over all things that are under His rule, it is the church who is given that responsibility. For the church is His body and Christ is the head. And as head, He directs the body. We get our instructions from Christ, from His Word. We get our strength from Christ, from His Spirit. And His Word says that we have a mission. And our mission is 
for the kingdom of Christ to manifest in the life of the church. And we do that by proclaiming the gospel to the world. We proclaim the news about the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the sins of men. We should proclaim the news about Him being raised from the dead and being seated at the right hand of God. We should proclaim the news about Him being supreme over all rule and authority and power and dominion. We proclaim the news about Him being installed as King and that as King He claims and He demands submission from willing servants and subjects. And so we tell the world to repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ the King. That is our mission. Secondary, of course, to our primary task is to meet together every Sunday and to do corporate worship. But, but second to that, our mission is to proclaim the gospel outside. That is our responsibility. It is not the responsibility of any other kingdoms. In the time of Paul, he doesn't expect the Roman Empire to, 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 to have this mission to proclaim the gospel. Nero cannot even provide salvation. It is only Christ who can do that. And Christ entrusted that mission to us. And sometimes, we have this expectation that it is the government's mission. It is the government's mission. We cannot expect the government to spread the gospel. We cannot expect the government to provide even moral fiber. It is the church's job. The government's job is to protect the people, to provide order and justice. The church's job is to spread the news about the justice of Christ that is to be experienced by the world if they do not put their faith in Christ, who alone can satisfy that justice. We are to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. We are to expand the kingdom of Christ. We are to call them to submit to the rule and the headship of Christ. And as we learned a while ago, that His rule does not change. Jesus is King. He is still King. He is forever King. And the gospel does not change. So is our mission. We spread the gospel. That means that we do not, that means we do not result to any other missions other than the proclamation of the gospel. Benevolence is not the primary mission of the church. Yes, it is a mandate, and we need to have such ministries in the future, but that is not the primary mission of the church. And some churches today have put a lot of emphasis in benevolence, in charity, Again, nothing bad, nothing bad about that. And we should do that in the future. But that is not our mission outside. That in itself is not, that in itself, benevolence or charity does not expand the kingdom of Christ. It is the proclamation of the gospel that does that. Imagine, imagine in your own homes. When you show love, when you show care and affection to your family members, I mean, of course, that's not bad, that's good. I mean, that should be the characteristic of every Christian uh, person. Of course, as well as kingdom servants, as men and women and women of Christ, we are distinguished by our ethic as Christians, and that is the righteousness of Christ, that they should see the righteousness of Christ. So see, showing love and care to your family members, I mean, it's commendable. But that in itself does not do the job. That does not save their souls. See, if a Christian resorts to just being a good person inside his home, thinking that his family members would be able to be saved because of his kindness, because of his generosity, well, unfortunately, if that Christian passes away, the family of that Christian will always remember that Christian as a good person. And that's it. They did not even know why you are the way you are and what made you the way you are. 
Well, they need to know why you do what you do. They need to know why, you, why such love emanates from you. They need to know that you represent a king. They need to know that whatever ministry you're doing is a service to your king. They need to know why you're always out of the house every Sunday. It's because you worship a king. They need to know the good news about our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everything is about the King. And so, a while ago in my intro, I, I told you about Adoniram Judson. Well, his family and Adoniram were missionaries. They, they traveled across India and their destination really was Burma. And I, I mentioned a while ago that he... Uh, translated the Bible from English to Burmese. And so, before coming to Burma, Adoniram and his family members were told that the people in Burma was impermeable, meaning the, the people in Burma do not accept evangelism. Do, they do not accept any Christian evangelism. And so what Adoniram did, he prayed for years, he studied, and he, he actually learned the Burmese language for three years. For three years and that is for him to be able to translate the English Bible to Burmese to the Burmese Bible that they have now which is up until now they are using and when one and one of the first books when one of the first books which is the Gospel of Matthew uh, was translated when he was finished he immediately evangelized in front of 18 people he preached the gospel to them using the, the gospel of Matthew that he himself has translated. And the first believer there was baptized. And then the rest of the 17 were also baptized and proclaimed their faith. So see how Adoniram Judson did not lose his zeal for evangelism. Knowing that his king is Jesus Christ and that he is above over any king. And just like Judson, the more we realize Christ's kingship, the more we realize His grace in saving people. So the challenge for all of us is to spread that and be faithful in that mission. And we make that as our prayer for our church and for other churches. We are to pray for the churches, for them to constantly realize the kingship of Christ, that when they realize it, they would be faithful in their corporate worship inside. Let us also pray for the church, for them to be constantly reminded of their responsibility under Christ's rule. That when they are reminded of it, they would be faithful in their evangelism outside. And in both cases, when the church is faithful and responsible in both, it manifests the rule of Christ. It manifests Christ as king. It manifests Christ as the supreme ruler of all. It manifests Christ as the head who directs his body. And the more that the church manifests the rule of Christ, the world will see the reign and the glory of Christ in his church. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder that we have a king whom we are worshiping. That he is not a dead God, that he has risen, and that he has been installed as king, that he has authority over all creation. But more than that, oh Lord, thank you for the reminder that he is also the head of the church that He directs us, that He does not just fill us. He directs, he directs us, gives us strength through His Spirit. And Lord, may this also be a reminder for us to be faithful and responsible in all the ordinances that the King has given us. Lord, we thank You. And may this Word just nourish us and change us into becoming a better Christian and a, and a better church. Again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.